On this channel, we talk about the importance of the fundamentals of screenwriting. We highlight the relevance of cohesive scene construction, simple story structure, and building characters based upon opposing beliefs. However, there is one famous screenwriter who is notorious for breaking away from these concepts. And the Oscar goes to Charlie Kaufman, Michael Gondry, and Pierre Bismuth for Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Charlie Kaufman is known for writing and directing surreal movies about love, loneliness, anxiety, and identity. But above that, he is known for successfully rebelling against all of the fundamentals of screenwriting while still receiving critical and audience praise. How is he able to do this? Is it because the principles of screenwriting are a burden and Kaufman's rejection of them allows him to flourish? Not really. Instead, I believe there is one very simple principle that serves as a foundation of Kaufman's success. Every unconventional choice that Charlie Kaufman makes is always in service of strengthening the story's philosophical conflict. Today I want to look at how Kaufman is able to use his philosophical conflicts to bend the principles of scene construction, story structure, and character building in a way that is cohesive and adds depth to his movies. But more importantly, I want to show you what you can take away from Kaufman's rule subversion and apply it to your own writing. This is why you should study Charlie Kaufman. So I've explained that when writing scenes, writers must ask themselves what happens in this scene that changes the story and moves it forward. Every scene must move the story forward, as each scene must cause the next one. Scenes must be like a line of dominoes, where the events that happen in one trigger the events in the next one. Kaufman completely subverts this concept in Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. He does so by telling the love story between Joel and Clementine backwards. Joel enters a memory erasing procedure to erase Clementine from his brain, deleting each memory in their relationship from the most recent to the earliest. Thus, as we are moving back in time, one scene does not cause the next one. Instead, it is the other way around. Conceptually, this should not work. Ordering events backwards removes the natural flow of cause and effect we crave in stories. This can result in the audience growing confused or bored. Yet, Eternal Sunshine has touched millions of viewers exactly because of the way it constructs its scenes. How does Kaufman pull this off? By ordering his scenes backward, Kaufman allows the audience as well as Joel to move further back in the past of Joel and Clementine's relationship. This way we can go from witnessing their recent and hurtful memories to slowly seeing their older and better moments together. Kaufman allows Joel, as well as the viewer, to go on a journey into the past to make the point that even though the past may hurt, we should never choose to forget the experiences that have made us who we are. It was only by ordering scenes in this unusual format that Kaufman allowed the philosophical conflict to flourish and for Joel's character arc to naturally progress from one set of beliefs to another. Please let me keep this memory. Just this one. Can you hear me? I don't want this anymore. I want to call it off. This permitted Kaufman to argue that accepting the past ultimately wins over forgetting the past. Even if we don't have scenes that are linked through causality, we are still invested in the story because this rule break is built to serve the philosophical conflict. On this channel, I've talked multiple times about Harmon's story circle. This is a simple tool that writers can use to create a rhythm of momentum and change in their story. It is a great tool because it feeds our natural perception of want and cost, which many stories should abide by. However, in Synecdoche, New York, Charlie Kaufman plays around the rhythm of change and momentum that comes with story structure. This is done because the movie follows Caden's point of view and skips across time constantly. Characters die, and those deaths leave no impact on the story, and relationships are broken due to events that happened completely off-screen. The movie rushes through important events or completely skips over certain plot beats, not allowing the audience to experience a clear rhythm of change. Because of this time inconsistency, there is often no want and cost relationship in the events of the story. Again, theoretically, this should not work. Stories with inconsistent structure will leave the audience dissatisfied and confused. 
However, Kaufman uses this unconventional time-skipping structure to drive home the story's philosophical conflict of living life versus anticipating death. Every time Caden finds something meaningful in his life, such as winning a grant to fund his play, the movie slows down and we get a sense of want and cost. Caden has found things that make his life make sense, and because of that, the story gains a natural sense of structure. However, every time Caden becomes obsessed with his terminal illness, years of his life are skimmed over in the blink of an eye. The more Caden worries about dying, the more events he misses. Caden. What? When are we going to get an audience in here? It's been 17 years. Every time death becomes the center of the narrative, we lose the sense of the want and cost relationship that comes with structure. This is done to illustrate that to Caden, when death is around the corner, nothing else matters. Synecdoche, New York doesn't have a traditional structure, but a perceived structure. This is a structure that wasn't placed to favor a typical three-act model, but a structure that was placed to favor the philosophical conflict. Kaufman bends traditional structure to drive home the message that we should not live life in the fear of death, as it might be over before we even start living it. I don't want to do this play now. I have an idea. I think. Die. On this channel, I've also talked about how writers should build characters by giving them a specific value system that places them in conflict with each other. In other words, characters should create a web of different beliefs that clash or complement each other. By having characters with different beliefs, we naturally create conflict. In I'm Thinking of Ending Things, however, Kaufman reaches his peak abstraction, not only deviating from scene logic and story structure, but also subverting belief-based character construction. Here, all of the characters are figments of old Jake's mind. Because of that, instead of having a web of different beliefs, all the characters in the movie hold the exact same belief. Jake, despite having great aspirations and intellectual prowess, believes that, due to outside conditions and his own patheticness, he is destined to be lonely. Jake's mom believes that Jake had no special talents or skills growing up. This only cements the belief in Jake's inferiority. Jake's dad is against Jake's artistic aspirations, belittling Jake's art. Again, this is here to strengthen Jake's inferiority and loneliness. The girls in Tulsi Town reinforce the belief that Jake is repulsive and will never have access to their beauty. Even the young woman, who, despite being an illusion of an ideal girlfriend, wants to break up with Jake and grows increasingly repulsed by him. And then this guy kept looking at me. It is a nuisance, the occupational hazard of being a female. You can't even go for a drink, always being looked at. He was a creeper, you know? <laughs> it's like asking me to describe a mosquito that bit me on an evening 40 years ago. Conceptually, this should be a disaster. Only having characters who agree with each other creates a story with no conflict. And to some people, this movie may be a disaster. To many, Kaufman has gone too far and removed too many storytelling elements for it to even feel like a story. However, to others, this was one of Kaufman's masterworks. To many, this movie has left a deep intellectual and emotional impact on them. How? Through philosophical conflict. I'm Thinking of Ending Things is a perfect illustration of the core of storytelling because it is a movie that strips away all of storytelling's non-core elements. It strips away scene cohesion, it strips away story structure, it strips away belief-based character building. The only thing we are left with is the philosophical conflict. I'm Thinking of Ending Things deals with the philosophical conflict of loneliness and self-destruction, and it's this philosophy that dictates all of its unconventional elements. In order to emphasize the idea of loneliness, Kaufman has all the characters hold the same belief, creating the feeling of Jake being trapped inside his own head. Every figment of his mind believes in some way he is inferior, because Jake has no one else in his life to convince him otherwise. Having characters with opposing beliefs would have contradicted the idea of loneliness and the way that Kaufman wanted to tackle. But where does the conflict come from? If there are no opposing set of beliefs, how can there be conflict? 
Instead of relying on clashing beliefs, the movie's conflict sparks from this single set of beliefs crumbling upon itself. As Jake grows increasingly desperate with his loneliness, he moves closer and closer to self-destruction. The belief of loneliness and self-destruction serves as its own great opposing force. This philosophical idea of self-destruction sparks conflict between the characters despite them holding the same belief. Now you have understood what makes Charlie Kaufman a master of his craft. It is not his rule-breaking or surreal concepts, instead it is his firm grasp on philosophical conflict. But before I conclude, I must give you a word of warning regarding Kaufman. Many writers who don't want to learn the fundamentals of screenwriting like to point at Kaufman and say, see, he doesn't follow the rules, he does whatever he wants and is successful and acclaimed, this means I don't need to follow these rules either. Don't be that writer. I'm not making this video to encourage you to break conventions. I'm not encouraging you to order your scenes backwards, skip through time, or make all of your characters fragments of someone's imagination. If you're in the first few screenplays, I strongly advise against breaking conventions. You need to fully understand the principles of screenwriting and be able to apply them to your stories before you even think of deviating from them. However, I am encouraging you to look at how Kaufman breaks these principles because of his understanding of the core of storytelling. He knows stories are not about structure or rules. Stories are about how we should live life. Kaufman doesn't really ignore the principles of screenwriting. He understands these principles and knows their importance, but he chooses to bend them in favor of his philosophical conflict. And if you really wish to break the rules in your writing, you can learn from Kaufman. You can see that when taking creative liberties, you must always do so in favor of your philosophical conflict. If you're a writer who is struggling to consistently finish your screenplays, stuck writing short scripts, and afraid of that 100 page feature, then I have a video for you to watch that handles the three things you need to equip yourself to get that story out onto the page. Click the first link in the description to watch for free now. This video was written by Alberto Halfeld, a member of the Practical Screenwriting Team. Thanks for watching.